In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Today, as I'm sure you're aware, is uh, the anniversary of the conversion of St. Paul, or the feast of the conversion uh, of St. Paul. And with this uh, feast day, we, we come to the end of the week of prayer, or the octave of prayer, for the unity of Christians. And uh, that's why we want to look back now at his life, considering that it is a conversion that has had such monumental importance in the history of salvation, that it's worthwhile to look at what a conversion is and how the conversion of one soul can so dramatically impact a whole generation and a whole more than a generation, I mean a whole society, really. Because we know the life of St. Paul is divided in two parts, days without Christ and the days in Christ. They're clearly defined. And I, I would say that few conversions have had such tremendous effect in the church and in the world. He was at one point Saul, terribly hostile and violent, full of zeal against the Christians. But I would say it was a misplaced zeal. It wasn't a hatred. He was just misguided in his zeal. We know he was born in Tarsus, in Cilicia, a a province uh, of his Jewish parents, who were descendants from the tribe of Benjamin. So in order to complete his schooling, he was sent from there, from Tarsus to Jerusalem. And he sat at the feet of a very well-known scholar whose name was Gamaliel and was educated in the most strict, strict, strict observance of the law. And we know this from him, from his own account. And he also acquired a very deep knowledge of exegesis, trained in the practice of disputation, of dialoguing and speaking about the law. And he had therefore a certain education that made him thoroughly knowledgeable in scriptures and probably he could recite fairly large passages of the scriptures. He would have memorized them, well-versed in law. And in particular, he was very well-versed in languages. As an educated Jew, he would have known, of course, Hebrew. I would suspect he even knew a bit of Aramaic. That was the language that the Jews that came back from exile had adopted it was a kind of a mixture with between Hebrew and 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 uh, Persian, so it was like a it was kind of Hebrew, I don't know, Hebrew dialect, right? and uh, so he he would have known that. So he knew Hebrew, he knew Greek, and he knew Latin, the three fundamental languages of the Greco-Roman world at the time. There were other languages too. But those were the most important ones. And he knew them, I would say, perfectly well. And he was a Roman citizen. 
by birth. And, uh, and uh, of course, we know that several occurrences took place, one after the other, in swift succession. First, there was the murder of Stephen, then the persecution of the Christians in Judea. He felt that this was a sect that was growing that had to be eliminated. And then his trip to Damascus. That trip from Jerusalem to, to Damascus, well, at least walking probably would have taken maybe six to seven days if you took the Via Maris on the west coast. Uh, we know that Abraham took that route, Jacob t- took that route, Rachel had traveled that. And uh, for many, traveling along the sea would have been beautiful. Delightful, cool nights, and uh, you know the travelers would gather around, uh, gra- gather around a crackling fire under the starry night that shone on the dark, velvet skies. I just, I just picture Van Gogh's uh, starry night, no. which is now worth a hundred million dollars, by the way, if you want to buy it. But Paul was not a natural, a guy of nature. He was a city guy. He was a guy from the city. He took the subway, basically, right? And I would say he would have little taste for the beauties of nature like Van Gogh did many centuries later. In fact, in all his letters, there's nothing about the beauties of nature, zero. What was important to him was the spiritual realities, was man, his psychological dimension, and of course God and the scriptures. It's all good nature, but I don't have time for that, he would have said. And that's part of what contributed to his zeal. You know, some people would have stopped, oh, let's stop here and look, oh, look, isn't this, well, let's stop and do a drawing here, you know, but he didn't have time for that. And uh, man, was far more interesting to him than nature. But by now, as he's traveling, on his way to Damascus, sort of breathing fire, so to speak, he was a hunter driven by this insatiable desire to catch his prey. I have never gone hunting But I'm sure that if you want to catch your prey, you just want to get it now, right? And uh, this is no doubt what he wanted. I've heard of some hunters sitting in the forest just waiting and waiting and waiting, but that's like the most boring thing you can do, you know, wait till a deer passes or something, right? But uh, that's not what he was going to do. And so... He was not, however, the only hunter at that moment on his way to Damascus. There was another hunter. The master of these disciples that he was hunting. That hunter was on his trail. Little did he know that. Paul thought he was the hunter, but he was, in fact, the quarry. The famous poem by Francis Thompson from the 19th century, The Hound of Heaven, this idea that God is, is, is like hunts after us and we are perpetually being kind of hunted by God in our conscience and in our, in our spiritual seeking Christ is the, is the, you know, we are like the hound of heaven. You know, we are being hunted. And uh, in that sense, you could say that Christ is the divine hunter. And here on the road to Damascus, he is running down his most precious quarry, the quarry that will just not be able to escape. And he was now outside of the, of the world, the metropolis that he liked so much, the metropolis of Jerusalem, 
where everything is noisy and you could easily hide away from God and with all the lights and all the action and all the activity. But now he was truly in nature and in some ways he was really at the bar of his own conscience. And it's in that moment that he is illuminated in a moment that is the reversal of his entire life, what we call the great reversal. And, and, and Jesus appears to him, surrounded, surrounds him by that tremendous light. Others uh, saw the light, but they could not hear him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It doesn't say, why are you persecuting the Christians? Why are you persecuting the truth? Why are you persecuting me? And uh, St. Paul is, is overthrown, is, is, is taken aback, he's blinded, he's blinded by that light. You may have seen the, the famous painting that is uh, in, uh, in Santa Maria del de Popolo, in, in Rome, the famous uh, Renaissance church. Well, it's an ancient church, but it has a Baroque painting by Caravaggio, which shows the moment in which uh, St. Paul has fallen off his horse. There's no indication in the, in, the, in the passage that there was a horse there, but, you know, um, Caravaggio includes a horse. But in this painting, Paul seems to be stretching out his hands. The horse is very bemused and uninterested at what's going on. Paul looks himself like he is dressed almost as though he were in Roman armor. What was going on in that moment? What was happening? What exactly was that reversal truly all about? And to what extent do we ourselves incorporate ourselves in that moment? Well, the best explanation of St. Paul's conversion is the one that he himself speaks about when he speaks about Christian baptism as being a baptism in which we are baptized into the death of Christ, buried with him, to rise with him, and to walk in a newness of life. This idea of being kind of united with Christ. And with words of very, very ancient tradition, which also received, we received from the church of Jerusalem, he says that Jesus died, crucified, was buried, and after his resurrection appeared to Chephas, that is to, to Peter, then to the twelve, and afterwards to five hundred brothers, who are still alive at that time, then to James, and then last, and then to all the apostles. And to this account, received from tradition, he adds, last of all he appeared also to me, as one who was like, like a stillborn child. He also appeared to me. So the idea being is that our Lord appeared to me, like the risen Christ appeared to me. There, so that was the risen Christ. That was the risen Christ. Just like he appeared to Peter on the shores of the lake of Genesaret and the others, or Mary Magdalene, he appeared to Paul too. And St. Paul himself never actually uses the word Conversion. He doesn't say, oh yeah, that's when I converted. Of course, it was a change of, of life. But that transformation of his whole being was not the result of a psychological process. It was not the result, as Pope Benedict has said, of the maturation or intellectual or moral evolution of his thought. but it came from outside. It was not the result of his thinking, but an encounter with the risen Lord. That's why he said, he, he appeared to me. 
he appeared to me. In that sense, as Saint Paul, as uh, Pope Benedict said, it's not a conversion, simply a conversion, but a or a or a maturing of the I. Rather, it is the death and resurrection for himself. A life of his died, and a new one was born with the risen Christ. So the, the idea that something in him died, and he was risen anew in Christ. And therefore he relived in himself the Paschal mystery of Christ, in which all his thought now resolved, re- revolved, rather, because he was risen in Christ. What does that mean to say, I am risen in Christ? In fact, if you look at the scriptures carefully, there are also an impressive amount of external analogies between him and Christ. Jesus remained three days in the sepulchre, and for three days, Saul was like dead. He was like in the sepulchre. He was there. <laughs> you know, he couldn't see. He couldn't stand. He couldn't eat. Everybody thought he was pretty much dead. But then he was baptized. And his eyes opened. And he was able to eat and gather strength. And he came back to life. He was like risen, like Jesus. Jesus. After that, he went to Arabia, probably probably for some 10 years. Jews tried to kill him. The Christians were hostile to him, or at, least, or at least didn't trust him yet. It took a while for them to trust him. A bit like what happened when Cardinal Newman converted. Cardinal Newman converted in uh, whatever it was, 1850 or whatever it was, and, uh, and um, of course the Anglicans who... You know, they, they were very hostile to him, but also the Catholics, you know, the, he, he was received in the Catholic Church, but they said, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? It took a lot of humility on the part of Cardinal Newman. But we know, of course, all those qualities that St. Paul had, his education, his languages, his zeal. But it's possible that despite all those qualities, God could never have made him into St. Paul without St. Barnabas. St. Barnabas was one of the apostles. And we know that after all that that time of insecurity and and study, we know that it was St. Barnabas who took St. Paul, brought him to the apostles and declared you know, what happened to him on the road to, to that the Lord uh, appeared to him and spoke to him on the road to Damascus and how he preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Right. And, and then after that, he went around Jerusalem and so forth. And so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And then he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they were together and you could say he formed Paul explained things to him. That's where Paul becomes the apostle of the Gentiles. But he could not have done all that with a bit of encouragement from Barnabas. Barnabas doesn't get much credit, but, but he, like, like if it wasn't for Barnabas, there would have been no St. Paul. Barnabas gave him prodding. Barnabas gave him guidance. God used others, in other words, to make him a great apostle. St. Paul was not a self-made man. He is the result first of initial grace from God, of course, that he received from God on the road to Damascus, but then others also acted, well, God acted in him through, through others. It was really Barnabas that made Paul the apostle that he was. It was he who pushed him to preach, and uh, you could say Barnabas was like a headhunter. He, he, he found the qualities, and uh, just as Christ was the hunter of Paul, Barnabas also was a headhunter. You know that, that story, that, that kind of cute story of the, the farmer who finds a little, a little eagle in the chicken coop and, 
and uh, the eagle doesn't know what he's doing there. The little eagle, his little baby eagle, chick, thinks he's a, he's a chicken and he doesn't know what to do and he can't fly or, or he just sees the other chicks, uh, you know, pecking around and he starts to get a little bit bigger and he's with the hens and he doesn't know what to do and, you know, so, so the farmer takes the, the little eaglet and he takes him to the heights and uh, with a bit of encouragement kind of throws him off and encourages him to fly and, and then the eagle realizes that, whoa, I can fly, you know, this is insane, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, he realizes that he's much more powerful than he realized. That took the encouragement of this, of this farmer. The farmer knows that this is a majestic eagle, but he has to be prodded and urged on to fly. And uh, maybe we have to open our hearts to that possibility Look, look at your friends, look at your relatives, look at people around you. Who are the St. Pauls that are around you? Maybe they're still far from God. Uh, but, but maybe they have tremendous human qualities that could be transformed into St. Pauls. I remember some years ago, in the days in which we heard a lot about ISIS and their horrible murders and massacres, how they were killing people and slaughtering Christians. I think it was Jacques Philippe, I think, who said that, well, we should pray that among all those zealous ISIS terrorists, there be a St. Paul there, right? There be a St. Paul there. All they have to do is find one that converts. And all that zeal that they have, that misguided zeal, can maybe do a lot of good. So he was given this task of presenting the gospel to the pagans, to this Greco-Roman world. At the same time, Paul learned that despite the immediateness of his relationship with the risen one, he also had to enter in communion with the church, to be baptized, and to live in harmony with the other apostles. In other words, just that personal experience wasn't going to be enough. He had to live in harmony. He needed to be in communion with the church, with the real mystical body of Christ. So what is all this today on this Feast of the Conversion? What are you, what are you trying to tell us, Lord, here? You are here with us. What are you trying to tell us about conversion? Or the conversion of St. Paul? What does it really mean for us? Well, Ultimately, it means that also for us, Christianity, the faith, is not really just a new philosophy. It's not an ideology. We're not just part of a group. It's not just a new morality. Ultimately, we are Christians only when we have that encounter with the risen, with the risen Christ. And... Naturally, he's not going to show himself in that irresistible way in which he showed himself to, to, to Paul, in that luminous way. But it is, it is an occasion for us today to introduce us to Christ in a new way, in a way that we get to know him deeper. And uh, you know, Paul does not want to be for us only a winter sun that illuminates but does not warm these days. It warms a little bit, but it's still cold. The obvious intention of his letters is to lead the reader not only to a knowledge, but also to a love and to a, a passion of Christ. The sun has to warm us. We have to be passionately in love with Jesus Christ and with his Blessed Mother, and with the Church. It's not just intellectual knowledge. It's not just doctrinal, I guess, ascetical knowledge. It's got to be, we've got to be passionately in love with our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to do that. In order to do that, we have to meet him. We have to encounter him. How? In Scripture, read him. In personal prayer. In the Holy Mass. When we have the Holy Mass here, we give thanks to God that we can have Holy Mass. 
We can touch Christ's heart and feel him touch us. Pope Francis has used an expression that we can adapt to our life. He said quite early in his pontificate, well, he used an expression that I have always liked. He said that we need a revolution of tenderness. A revolution of tenderness. He said this actually in a televised talk on a TED talk, which he gave in Vancouver in April of 2017. And there was a big auditorium and they were all watching him. Now you can see it on, on, you know, whatever, on on YouTube. But he has used that expression numerous times. But he said, first and foremost, I would love it if this meeting, this TED talk, could help to remind us that we all need each other and none of us is an island an autonomous and independent I, separated from the other. And we can only build the future by standing together, including everyone. And so he he spoke about solidarity, overcoming the culture of waste. But it's not just about wasting food, he said, but or or other things. But, you know, uh, but first and foremost, the people, we we can't waste them, we can't just cast them aside. And, and he, he said, we have to have a tenderness with each other. You know, how many people have a very bad impression of the church, not so much because of the ideas that the church teaches, but because they've had a bad experience with somebody in the church, maybe a priest who treated them harshly, who was just grumpy and moody one day. They say, come back another day, I don't have time for you. How many people have had that experience? And it stays seared in their memory. Like they, they were treated untenderly. Or somebody didn't listen to them. Or sometimes it's in their family. Sometimes we want to convince people in our family and among our relatives about something. And we just can't convince them. We're just on this logical focus, right? And all we need is a bit of tenderness, a bit of warmth. I think Paul had tremendous zeal, but that this this was a transformed zeal into a real tenderness. I think he had a he had a deep tenderness. At first, it was kind of murderous. He didn't seem to care about all the chaos he was causing, all the families, and all that. But that grace that he received flipped him, and his zeal continued but it was imbibed with a human tenderness. This savoir-faire, this warmth. So we, we have to open, be open to Christ in this way and ask our Blessed Mother to give us that, well, that real revolution of tenderness, just in the way you exchange and talk with others. And, well, St. Paul today, it's his feast, so... Let us ask him to intercede for us so that we walk with the risen Christ. Our life is with the risen Christ, not with an idea, not with a concept, not with a theory, not with a catechetical idea, but with the risen Christ who is alive, who is in our hearts, who is in our minds, and gives us that revolution of tenderness. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you've communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.